Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of NBS Radio. Usually, uh, we stay, we give help listeners stay up to date on the news with our roundtable segments, but today we're doing something a bit different, so we hope that uh, you guys and our listeners will enjoy some of the different types of content coming at you. In today's episode, we are doing a segment that uh, we're going to be calling it Dessert Island Discs, for legally distinct reasons, in which uh, I will be interviewing Holdo. Say hello. So, as the story goes, Holdem is being sent away. He's going to be exiled from the shores of the North Pacific for reasons undisclosed. And on his journey across the seas to wherever he might be headed, he needs a few items to bring. Items that can maybe either bring entertainment or comfort. Of those items will either be literature, such as books and other things that he might want to bring up, as well as music. Who doesn't love music? So throughout this interview, uh, I'm going to be giving a few prompts and then letting Holdem kind of explain some of his choices for what he would like to bl- bring along uh, over the course of his exile. So hopefully that sounds interesting to some of you guys. That is the uh, base concept for this show. But uh, I think a good way to start the show is uh, if you were to tell us a little bit about yourself, because this is a bit more of an out of character kind of thing. So. We'll just go ahead and get some bios to your comfortability. What what would you like to disclose? Yeah, so I'm 23 years old. Uh, I'm a political science PhD student at a university in the Northeastern United States. Um, without getting too deep into the woods, because my work, uh, the area I, I like really specialized in is, or you know, I'm trying to specialize in is relatively small. Um, I do work in comparative politics, specifically looking at this point at government violence. So. Uh, institutional violence, if, if anybody, you know, catches my drift at all. Um, but yeah, so that's about what I would, you know, say. <laughs> Fair enough. I know that uh, it's more of a niche thing for you, especially what you end up wanting to do. So that makes sense as to why, uh, you know, can't reveal the whole deck. But yeah. No, I'd say that's pretty cool. We're we're generally in the same age bracket. I myself am twenty, uh, going on twenty one here pretty soon. So, I think you're a bit further along in your professional development than I am. I'm a college student, and you're a graduate student. But you know, uh, we're both getting that getting that education, that good good education. So, the citizens of TNP, or the residents rather, have just voted you off the island, and you're on the first leg of your journey. What is the first piece of music? What would you say is the number one thing that yours is your go-to that you want to listen to immediately as you start your journey? Christ. Um, I didn't know how you were going to phrase this. Honestly, that's kind of a tough question. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that you have actually being voted off the island, like survivor style. I'm not a Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, um, I'm going to assume I'm going to, I'm going to play with it a little bit and suggest that ghost has, has, has decided that, uh, he, he's, he's done. So, yeah, I'm assuming that that's why I that's why I decided to leave. Um, <laughs> the first uh, album I like, I'm, I'm going to choose albums because I think they're you know better. Uh, so probably my favorite album, which is "Closing Time" by Tom Waits. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Tom is, or I should say, Waits or Tom, Tom Waits. Uh, he is a very like genre fluid artist um a lot of his work in recent years has been largely you know rock and roll i don't really listen to his 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 really recent stuff honestly i think he stopped i don't want to say he stopped being good like 1980 but like i I definitely find a lot less enjoyment in his stuff post 1980 and a large part of that is that a large uh, most of his earlier work was way more jazz inspired um i mean it was definitely full music or at least neo folk, but he definitely tried to hurt me. Um, been dealing with a little bit of a cold recently. Same, but he's been dealing with um, it is really jazz focused. So I really enjoy sort of the the way that he also is, you know, not only able to blend in jazz influences into you know his music, but is also really able to tell stories. And you know, all twelve songs on that album are fundamentally at their heart stories. Um, you know, between the very, very lovelorn, lonely, and rosy, uh, at Martha to, you know, I would say more reflective pieces like Old 55 and Midnight Lullaby and my favorite song of the album, um, Closing Time. So, 
Yeah, I think in the music industry especially, at least in my experience, I think you see a bit more of this nowadays with like artists kind of using genres or being very fluid in the type of genres that they put out. Um, I know that for me, obviously, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and out on a limb and guess that my music tastes are going to be very, um, very dis- like distinctly different from what yours are. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone kind of like gets down to their own vibe. And I think that's the great thing about it. Um, but I know that in my experience, like I've known people who do like rap rock, you know, like they'll, they, they start in- incorporating influences from like grunge and heavy metal into their rap or other people who, you know, maybe they used to be pop stars, but now they're country singers and things of that nature. You get people like mixing genres. So, you know, I can, I can totally see like the departure from jazz to something else. I know that, you know, some people really like getting down with like the smooth jazz. That's kind of their thing. And then some people, you know, they, they kind of like to, um, get the adrenaline pumping with something a bit heavier and, uh, you know, faster coming at you. So. Well, I think the thing that's sort of missed there is that smooth jazz is but one particular type of string of jazz. <laughs> um, and, you know, it smooth jazz is not the only, like I said, it's not the only type of jazz that's out there. There definitely is stuff that's way heavier, uh, you know, more in the vein that you would like. I would say especially the modern jazz industry has kind of moved towards this place and kind of being you know, really open to letting artists kind of choose their own path. So you do have people who are doing more neo-swing, neo-bop style stuff, uh, you know, and people who are putting really modern swing, really modern tinges on classic. See, one of my favorite current artists, Samara Joy. Um, but then again, you also have people who I think have really, you know, really melded, like, even now, jazz with, like, more modern funk and R&B. People like... Um, the band uh, Sweat, uh, Nubian Twist and Sweta Kinch, like they've done some really, really cool work that's been like, that melds sorts of these different discordant kind of, you know, sounds together in a way that is genuinely really interesting. Yeah, and I tend to like that fusion personally. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. I know that there are, you know, some people out there who, especially when it comes to like covers, will hear like a cover of a song but it'll be done in like a different style and it'll just be like one of those things where it's like, you know, this isn't supposed to be a blank genre of song. This is supposed to be however, you know, the artist originally recorded it. But personally, I don't, I don't tend to mind that. I think, uh, it's definitely a creative endeavor and I think that you can do a lot with that. Um, so I'd say that, uh, we can definitely enjoy kind of like the fusion, the mashups, on the subject of jazz, though, I was going to say it'd be great if we had Bob here in the audience because I know that he especially is really um, into like knowing different kinds of jazz and classical music and things like that. I think that's something that he's pretty passionate about. So it'd, it'd be great to like hear him you know, tell us about jazz. Maybe that's something we can have in a future episode if uh, people are interested. Yeah, see if you want to do one of these. Yeah, that's kind of what this is. This is more of like a test episode to see if people enjoy this kind of style of content. And us just talking about, you know, things that we either enjoy or don't enjoy in real life and why do we do it? I mean, obviously, we kind of have, like, the backdrop here of the whole, like, castaway slash bring this on your, you know, excursion to a different place. But, I mean, yeah, the main main point of this, uh, for those of you who are kind of wondering what we're on about here, is that, yeah, it's just T and peers talking about things that they enjoy in real life and maybe some subjects that you don't usually get on NBS, but you are going to get that, um with this episode so for a lot of these i'm i'm gonna go ahead and say that i'm probably not familiar with them so as you talk about them you're definitely going to be able to um educate me and kind of show me a bit about these artists who i otherwise would have not heard of um i guess a good question to ask is where do you where do you mostly get your music from like what is your preferred platform of choice for music oh god apple music for sure i mean i and I know that's, I have a very pretentious reason for doing it. And some of it is just like, you can definitely pick out some inconsistencies in Spotify's audio, especially with stuff that I'm interested in, that make it kind of, di- it's not like a difficult listen, but it's like, God, I wish those weren't there. See, for Apple Music just comes across a little smoother for me. Yeah, I know some people are really big into like the the crisp audio quality, like that's a big thing for them. I mean, everyone kind of weighs things on a different scale. Some people want, like, UI usability, accessibility. 
And then some people are really down to like, this just sounds really good, like on this platform. You know, to be, to be clear here, I don't necessarily think that Apple Music's UI is that much more difficult to use than Spotify. Yeah. So oh. like, I, I don't release, really, I mean, I think that they mean, like I had a Spotify subscription for the longest time. And like the, the really, the only difference for me was just like, okay, this sounds better. And so I would want to use it. And honestly, I don't really know that many platforms. I know of like Apple Music, Spotify, I know SoundCloud, there's Tidal. I know Tidal is one of the ones where people say it just like sounds different. Uh, so I know some people like to get, to get like their music off of there. But um, me personally, I'm a, I'm a SoundCloud guy and I have a reason for that. So people are like, why SoundCloud? I, I, I thought about it and for me, I guess I just think that like, you, you, we were talking about like the jazz industry and like the industries of music, you know, I think for me and the way that I think about it, it's just like the, the it's more of a free flowing, like creative endeavor. So with SoundCloud, I kind of like that organic feel to it. This idea that it's not as like tightly vetted as maybe some other platforms are and where people can kind of just put what they want and share what they want. Now, the downside to that, I will admit, is that you kind of do have to sift through some of the lower quality stuff. Um, that is that is like kind of one of the uh, downsides to that. But I do enjoy how like I can find a song that I like and that I vibe with and it might only have like less than 20 plays. So it's like, I don't know, that feeling of like discovery of like the unknown. I just feel like Spotify and Apple Music, it's just more, and some people like this in a way, but I feel like it's more well moderated. Whereas to me, SoundCloud is more like creative and free flowing and not to say that those other platforms aren't, but for my taste, I kind of just like how I can find whatever I want on there. And then, you know, I might be one of a couple dozen people who listens to it, but mm -hmm. I do like that. Yeah. You know, I can't say I, I've used Apple music. I haven't, I have an iPhone. I've always been like an Apple kind of person, but I haven't used Apple music. I don't think. Yeah, no, I will say one of the things, uh, one of the other platforms I know at least is somewhat popular, and I think it's kind of fitting that we have Vara in the audience for this, is, is Amazon Music, because I know Vara prefers Amazon Music over the others. I don't know why. I don't know why Vara is that sicko, but, you know. <laughs> maybe maybe he'll tell us in the chat over here, and then, yeah, I know everyone kind of just has, like, their own thing, and they're all valid in their own ways, but I think that um, that's the other thing. Like, sometimes you'll go onto a platform and maybe not find what you're looking for. And I feel like I rarely have had that problem on SoundCloud. Sometimes it'll be like, oh, this song by this artist, like you have to have like the the plus subscription or something. But for the most part, I've been able to find a lot of cool stuff on there, like mashups and stuff like that, where people will just do all these different things. I know a big thing, especially like in um, like rock and rap music, is where people will do like slowed to perfection, like slowed plus reverb. I don't know if you um, listen to any of those kind of tracks where people will kind of change the way the pacing of it, but. No, not that really I can think of. Yeah. I mean, some, obviously the songs are good as they are. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. I kind of just like seeing sometimes what people will do with it. Cause I know that there are some versions of songs that I would consider better. And then also some versions of songs that I would consider worse. So yeah. Well, all right, we've we've went ahead and uh, done one album for you. So, is there a book that you'd like to share to kind of round out that? Gosh, I mean, it's kind of picked between ones that like I've read and would just love to read again, and like stuff that like I I know that I would, you know, want to want to read and maybe add the chance to. So, I'll give. Probably the favorite book I've read this year, which funny enough, I had to read for a grad seminar at the university I'm at, uh, which is Pat's Out of Dixie, The, Author the Democratization of Authoritarian Enclaves in America's Deep South, 1944 to 1972. And Mickey, so the author, Robert Mickey, he's a professor at, at the University of Michigan, and um, he essentially is writing about the democratization of the Deep South. I should even say essentially that's what he's doing, but he, his, his, his central thesis, and I think it's the, it's something he shows, you can't prove anything in social science really, um, is that, you know, we shouldn't think of the South as being, you know, that we shouldn't think of the South as just being culturally distinct. 
we should think about it as being politically distinct as well. And specifically, we should think about the Deep South, in particular, at least South Carolina, Mississippi, and Georgia, as representing authoritarian enclaves within the United States that then pursued differing paths to being fully fledged members of the democratic, like, you know, society in the United States. Um, fantastic narrative. It's one of those books that you kind of have to read every sentence of. I know I had classmates who skimmed it and I'm just like, you don't get it. It's not the same. Um, but it's a fantastic book. Even if I just finished it, like definitely something I'd let her read again. So yeah. <laughs> That, uh, that was a bit of a mouthful of the title. It sounds like, you know, that kind of thesis could definitely be interesting depending on what tone it takes. Would you say it's more of like a dry academic book or would you say it's more kind of like a historical like novel in a way with some illustrations of like how he thinks about these things? I mean, it's very much an academic text. Like Mickey, Mick, so, and I will, I will tell you what my professor who assigned this text told us about the book. So Mickey, apparently, the the idea for it and, like, a good chunk of it was how he uh, got his PhD, like, how he got out his dissertation. It was a dissertation. And then the manuscript, the actual, the manuscript is what got him his tenure-track job at Michigan, and then his the book got him tenure. So it's very much an academic text, but it doesn't read. And at times it can read like it, like, not terribly. But it's it's definitely like I said, it's something you have to read very carefully. But at the end, Mickey is telling a story, and he does a very good job of that. It's just an incredibly detailed story. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring up the South, particularly as like one of the first books where that's the the main thing it's looking at. Because this kind of relates to a conversation I was just having maybe earlier this week with a friend of mine, who's really into books and is a big reader. Um, and we were talking about like the different genres we enjoy and stuff like that, fictional versus non-fictional, like all, um, different genres of text. They say, I wouldn't really consider myself like a big time reader. I wouldn't say in the sense that if I need to like get information from texts, I'll definitely do that. In fact, I do it all the time on my phone, but as far as like sitting down and reading for pleasure, it's not, uh something that I usually do. So if you were assigned this in a class, I'm assuming it's mostly something it was kind of the former category where you have to get something from the text, like information wise for the class. Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, I think but the thing is like, honestly, you don't do a PhD program in any field unless you really love it. That's unless true. You really enjoy studying it and getting to know it. And, you know, I think that's the thing is like, there will be things you like reading more than others. There will be, you know, authors in your field, people who do work in your field who you will be way, like their approaches, like the way they write just way more than others. But yeah, no, like it was definitely something that I also started way ahead because I was also like, I want to read this. So definitely it was like a mix of, okay, I'm reading this because I want to read it, but also, you know, this is something I need to read for the class. I need to get something out of it. Yeah, and I think it's always a benefit when you have to do it for, like, work or school, but it's also something that you generally enjoy. I know that there's, like, the old phrase of, like, oh, if you do something you enjoy, you never actually truly work. I know that people believe in that to varying degrees, but I think, yeah, if you're enthusiastic to learn something and you really want to, like, get down to it and read people in your field, I think that definitely makes it easier to, like, digest the perspectives and information. Because instead of like, oh, I have to get through this and it's like a slog and you have to force yourself to do it, I think it's a lot better if it if it's something that you just generally find in interesting and entertaining to the point where you would read it regardless of whether it's for a class or not, just because it's something from your field that you're interested in already. The discussion I had with my friend kind of stemmed along because you said like the social sciences don't have a definitive answer. And it was kind of in the same vein as that. I personally like the social sciences. I like philosophy and things of that nature. And I've taken a few classes at the college level for that, uh, mostly electives. But, um, and, and her counterpoint to that, my friends, was that she likes it when there's a definitive answer. Because it, in, in her opinion, the social sciences, it's basically like telling students where it's like, oh, yeah, here's this concept that's been debated for, you know, 50 plus years now. 
by experts in the field. And even amongst the experts, they can't really decide what the correct answer is or how they feel about it. So it's like, okay, you undergraduate student, well, in your case, graduate, but in my case, undergraduate student, you write an essay and you definitively say which is better. And it's like, uh, it, for her, that's a bit, a bit, a bit too tall of a task. I personally like it though, because as long as you can illustrate your thinking in a way that like makes sense and lines up with, uh, I don't, I don't want to say like the rules, but like, as long as it adheres to some approach based in, you know, academia, you can reasonably justify what you're talking about. And you can kind of like form your own opinions on that. I personally like the social sciences. I think it's good for that reason. Yeah. And I don't really have too much to say to that because I mean, I think a large part of like, especially doing a dissertation, you know, which is the next thing, got another step, you know, like a couple of weeks from now ahead of it. But, you know, basically, once I'm in the dissertation writing things, like a large part of the dissertation thing is either finding something new that nobody's really done before. Or it's, you know, building on or altering an approach or coming up with an answer that like, you know, the literature thinks X, but, you know, what really happens is is Y. And, you know, not a, all of those responses are equally valid, but I think the, you're right, though, in the sense that like it very much is. There is no singular way to get to truth, which is also why we, you know, we're very cognizant of saying we're not proving something. We're just showing that there's there's this, you know, thing and you know, whether or not it's actually true is kind of, you know, a little up to the reader, a little bit up to like, well, we can never say with a thousand percent certainty that this is the way it happens. Right. With that kind of a community, especially amongst the more well-established authors of dissertations and whatnot, it's more like offering to others, here's how, here's what I would think about or Here's what I would think would be an answer to this or the truth. And you can kind of like take that and I sort I guess, you know, like digest it in your own way or critique it. I know some, some fields are very big on peer reviews and critiques and people will absolutely um, engage in that with others when they write something rightfully. So obviously to help make the text the best it can be. But um, yeah, there's no exact formula from point A to point B. It all has to deal with like the way we experience the world around us and the phenomena of social interaction. Um, I am going to go ahead and bring this up just because I, I thought about it and I am curious a bit. I know it's in your bio, so I, I'm sure it's something you might be uh, talking, like be okay with talking about. But would you say that like from being someone who is autistic, would you say that that helps or hurts your understanding of certain social concepts? Because I've wondered how that plays into it. I know how it plays into it for me, but I know that for others it's different. I mean, I think it's a little different, especially in all, uh, you know, at least in my discipline, because a large part of what we're you know really trying to understand is not like interpersonal relationships, or um, you know, we're not really interested in we're not really interested in social dynamics. We're interested in institutions, um, and if we're not interested in institutions, then what we're really interested in is collective behavior. So you know, fundamentally, like, we're not so much having to think through the cognition of, like, how, you know, how there are certainly people in political science, for instance, who are interested in how people get from, you know, seeing the item in the newspaper to their vote choice. Um, long answer, it's complicated, but the, the most heavy thing is it's kind of inherited and learned, um, you know, just over time. Uh, and people also generally don't do very well in acquiring political knowledge anyways. Um, but you know, one of the things that I would say is kind of, you know, at least in my, the, the work that I do is that, you know, we're not really interested in, 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 in the psychology of it. We're not really interested in like learning the concept of, of why people do this. What we're really interested in is measuring it and then seeing kind of, okay, we don't really, we don't really you need to explain why the why is sort of a psychology question it's a sociology question it's not a question that you know fundamentally takes political scientists to, to to answer um but you know why it happens institutionally is kind of our question what are the power structures that allow that to occur so i mean i would say definitely like for me it's it definitely makes it a little harder to understand some of these like interrelational you know 
the some of the human side of it. But by that same token, like I don't it was my work. I don't have to. Not really. At least not like super. Okay, that makes sense. So it's more of a consideration that's a little bit more diverse from your field, whereas what your field is concerned with are things that are easier able to uh, be grasped. I would say for me, most of my experience of taking classes had to deal with like around sociology and psychology, like the why of how these phenomenons form or why they exist, as opposed to just like quantifying them and see how they relate in like the, the practical application of, you know, things. For me, it's always been one of those things. I'll give you a good example. Uh, one of the classes I took a couple semesters ago was in ethics. It was literally an ethics course, which we were talking about, like, the different, uh, you know, approaches that some people will have to that, different schools of thought about what's ethical, what isn't, this and that. And I ended up doing well in the class. I got an A in the class. But sometimes it is hard for me personally to, like, digest the concepts in a way that, you know, maybe others would. Because some people will, will will get these, you know, theories or things of that nature and they'll see them and they'll be like, yes, absolutely. That makes sense to me. But then I like subconsciously always take it a step further and I always ask myself like, well, why? Like, why do people best their faith in X approach or X theory, you know? Like, I, I that's just a thing for me. But I guess in your field, it does make sense that that's not really the focus of it. Uh, those kinds of questions, it's more, you know, what political scientists are concerned with more specifically. Yeah. I didn't really have much of a response to that, but yeah. Oh, no, it's good. Yeah, and we wanted this episode to be a bit more of a short blurb. Um, So with one music uh, take and then one piece of literature, we're at about the 30-minute mark. So here's the kicker. For uh, our for legally distinct purposes, you can bring a dessert. What dessert do you bring? Oh Christ! So this is kind of a tough one because, like, I, you know, I'm not a huge dessert person. Like on the whole, like I'll definitely eat it if, like, you know, if it's available to me. There's something I really want, but like, you know, I'm not going out of my way to like go it down. Like, you know, the moment I go to somewhere, so. I will say, uh, so there is a place in my hometown that made, that closed down back during the, well, because of the pandemic, they were, um, they were not like a fine dining place. They were definitely like a place you only went to on special occasions, but you know, they'd make like, you know, the stuff that you would kind of expect to have, like, you know, you go to somebody, you know, you go to your family's house for like, you know, holiday or a big get together and like, you know, they've got ham and fried chicken and, and, and mashed potatoes and green beans and all that. But they, what they, what they, their dessert, they, it was the only dessert they offered. They made a uh, cobbler, uh, which if you're not from the United States, you're not familiar. Essentially it's like food fruit, uh, and like a syrup that all the, that also has like a, that has like a, a top that's like typically like a biscuit. It was probably the best way to put it like an American biscuit, not like a cookie. And a lot of places also put more ice cream on top of it. And they made absolutely divine blueberry cobbler. And I just, I, I want that blueberry cobbler back in my life so bad. Hmm, blueberry. I think I've had peach before. Maybe even chocolate. Peach is good. But I'm not sure about Peach blueberry. is good. Peach is good. But their blueberry cobbler is something kidding it's different. Huh. All right. The blueberry cobbler. Yes, you, uh would get that back in your life if uh, this were... I, I don't know. I feel like I'm weird on dessert. I like chocolate toppings, you know? Like, you know, chocolate syrup, I'm fine with that. But the one thing I can't do is I need, like, a vanilla base. If I'm going to have some ice cream on something, I need it to be vanilla ice cream. I'm not really a fan of chocolate ice cream. But if there's, like, chocolate bits within the vanilla ice cream, like, if it's cookies and cream or something like that, like, I'm totally down with that. Uh, but as far as just, like, a strictly like chocolate ice cream like kind of dessert you know yours is more of more of like fruit uh with some ice cream added you know but for me i would say um like a like a warm brownie maybe some ice cream some caramel or something. that seems like a good idea as ruben go on ahead uh saying as ruben calls me a heretic for not liking chocolate ice cream 
I mean, we don't really eat, I don't really eat chocolate. So like, I, I don't really have, I don't really have anything, you know, to say to that. Cause I just, I don't, I, I don't eat chocolate period. So it's not like. Are you allergic or just don't like it? I just don't like it. I never like the taste. I never look like the texture. Hmm. So. What about like uh, baked goods? Like, are there any kind of baked goods that you essentially like, especially like? I mean, one of my friends makes a really good gluten-free banana bread. I, I like banana bread too. I like banana bread better than pumpkin bread. That's another thing. Never had pumpkin bread. Uh, it's one of those things that's more of like a holiday dish. You don't get it much, except for like around the holidays. I feel like, but pumpkin bread's not bad. But banana bread is where it at. Is where it's at. And if you do get banana bread, do you like it with nuts or without nuts? Oh, without. I don't really like nuts. Oh, okay. I know, because some people cook it both ways. They bake it both ways. I don't personally mind, as long as it's mostly like banana. I'm a sucker for some banana flavor. All right, so just go ahead and uh, give a recap uh, of your audio choice that you mentioned. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, God, Closing Time by Tom Waits. Your literary literature choice? So I'll give the short title, Pass Out of Dixie by uh, Robert Mickey. And your dessert choice. Uh, that would be a uh, blueberry cobbler from this restaurant in my hometown. It sounds like a good combination. Well, we wish Holdem a uh, safe journey on his way from the shores of the North Pacific. But yeah, that is uh, what you would bring with you. It's hard to argue with that. It seems like you've got some thoughtful choices up there. All right. This has been a bit of a shorter episode, as intended. But uh, hopefully this is kind of a little sneak peek into maybe some different kind of content that you guys could be enjoying here on NPS. So uh, thank you to some of our live audience members who were here in attendance, as well as Hold'em for joining me and being willing to do a show kind of like this on a more out-of-character tone. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, so... Uh, Thank you to everyone. We hope you enjoyed. This will hopefully be uploaded fairly shortly after uh, the conclusion of this, since it shouldn't take too much editing. Uh, but as I always say, this is NBS Radio, setting off.